Okay, welcome back everybody and welcome back, welcome to those who just tuned in. Uh, we will now continue the program with three lightning talks which were given by the three winners of the Open Research Award. Um, and before giving the floor to our speakers, I will shortly give you some background information about the award, the procedures that we followed. Uh, by the way, can everybody hear me correctly? See me? Yes, okay. Nice. Um, so the goal of the Open Research Awards is to raise awareness and promote research, open research practices and incentivize incorporating open research practices in research and acknowledging and rewarding it. While setting up this um, award, received great help from the University of Reading, who organized an Open Research Award last year. They were kind enough to share their materials with us. And I think Robert Darby of the University of Reading has joined our session. So Robert, a massive thanks from us to you for sharing the materials uh, with us. It was extremely helpful. Thank you for that. Um, and using the writing format, we set up submission guidelines and eligibility criteria. Uh, and we invited research and students of all faculties uh, to send in case studies in which they um, present open research practices and show how they use that. And this includes examples like pre-registering pre -registering a study, um, sharing research materials, data, syntaxes, publishing open access, and other initiatives to increase the accuracy of research findings. And after we closed uh, submission deadlines, we were happy to have received 17 submissions. Incidentally, I think it's the same number that Reading received in their first year. Um, submissions could be sent in either as an individual or as a team. I received 11 individual submissions and six team submissions. And as we tend to see in open science related activities, the vast majority of submissions came from early career researchers, mostly PhDs. Um, we also had one master student, it was very nice. Uh, and most submissions came from the medical sciences and um, behavioral and social science. Um, we were very happy uh, with the numbers uh, that and then the people that sent in a submission this year. Of course, the next year we hope to receive a bit more uh, submissions and we also hope to see a bit more diversity um, in faculties presented, represented. This was great already for a first year. After we um, received the submissions, they were evaluated by a jury. The jury consisted of five members, three of the OECG, that were Vera and me and Charlotte Freyer. Jules Maroy, he's a senior advisor in research policy and institutional research of the university. And Shannon Sakilar, he's a senior lecturer of the Faculty of Arts. This jury evaluated all the submissions and checked whether they adhere to eligibility criteria. And also, all submissions that were determined to be eligible received an open research certificate. This was the case of 14 out of 17 submissions. Uh, and by handing over research certificate to all eligible cases, we acknowledged and therefore of all who incorporated open research practices in their research. Um, for three of the 14 eligible submissions, there was an open research prize or award available of 500 euros. The winners of, the, of these prizes were determined in a kind of way that is unusual for this kind of events, namely via a lottery. Normally, a winner is determined uh, for a grant or an award is determined by the jury as well. Yeah, so we have a, have a lottery. I will quickly explain why we decided to use a lottery system um, to decide the winners of this award, of the um, Open Research Award. Research has shown that uh, it is very difficult to objectively decide which admission is the best. There is often great disagreement between reviewers in the rank of the proposals. And it's quite often impossible to differentiate between the highest ranked submissions, so to differentiate between the winner and not the winner. In essence, in conventional award and grant winner procedures, luck plays a huge part to determine the winner. By selecting the winner using a lottery system, we explicitly acknowledge the part that luck plays in the distribution of funds. An additional advantage is that the random part reduces the risk of bias and increases the diversity in recipients of awards. So in our eyes, this procedure is more fair and more open. 
Um, so on the 13th of September, there was a drawing of the winners. All eligible cases were entered into a bingo wheel and we drew three numbers. And the winners, the three winners were um, Melamarie Pesico, Mike Helmich, and Joram Kunkos and his team. They will now give uh, three short lightning talks. So I want to give the floor to our first speaker, and that is Merle Marie Pilkau, with a presentation about work in progress, first steps towards open science. Merle, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hello. I'm going to quickly share my presentation with you. Hope that you can see that now. Brilliant. Um, here we go. So. I am super lucky to be here today. I'm really excited because I'm one of the lucky ones whose name got picked for the Open Research Award, which means I got 10 minutes to chat to you today. And um, I thought it's going to be a bit more for getting to know each other, or rather you are going to get to know me and my very personal reasons for why I'm doing open science and how I'm doing open science. Because if you're anything like me, you're intimidated by this vast, majority of um, talks out there and lists out there and reading suggestions that are out there which are all tuning towards open science and they're trying to explain to you what are the pros what are the cons what should you be doing there's always something new to learn and i'm here to chat to you and say take a step back take a breath and every single step counts i'm going to share my first steps with you um, just a little bit about me and my research. I have a master's degree in clinical psychology. I'm now doing a PhD at the Faculty of Behavioral and Social Sciences in the Department of Statistics and Psychometrics, where I am primarily concerned with evaluating the statistical evidence of biomedical studies. And the big question that is kind of governing my PhD is when do we have enough evidence? Um, I'm not going to be talking about my research, as I just said, but if you're interested, the beauty of being open means that you can find everything that I do online. Um, so you can check out my Twitter handle, my OSAP page. You can also email me. I'm always super happy to chat about my work. Yeah, but that's not all we're talking about here, right? So we're talking about, and let me see if you can see my mouse. Yes, you can. So we're talking about this person here at the bottom. That's me in 2017. Not looking very excited yet, but I was very excited because I was starting as a research master student, and that is when my journey towards open science actually started. So 2017, I was taking part in the course Transparency in Science, uh, which was given by Rin Kukstra, Laura Bringman, and Don van der sadly being discontinued now. Shame. Um, but at that moment, we were having a project in that course, which for me then later on turned into an actual research project, which I'm going to be using to illustrate my open science journey, which means that I also have to tell you what I actually did. Um, we were concerned with the impact of the replication crisis in psychology. And personally, that meant for me the replication crisis in clinical psychology. And one of the key efforts that evolved as a response to the replication crisis was to increase the number of replications. However, if we're trying to do that, we ran into a big, big problem which is that we have many, many potential targets, um, but we have very limited resources, which for us meant that there is a need to select replication targets more systematically and more transparently to make better decisions. Um, so we set out to develop a list of criteria for replication target selection in clinical psychology with the aim to make it systematic and transparent. And this is when the struggle began. This illustrates my struggle. Um, that's my study room, which I spent hours and hours in during uh, working on this project. And what I realized is that while I was asking others to be more transparent, while I was pointing my fingers, like you shouldn't be doing that, you shouldn't be doing this behind closed doors, I was being a big, big hypocrite. I did the same thing. I was sitting in my little office or in my little study room at that time. Um, and I was doing everything behind closed doors, um, which I didn't like. That was huge cognitive dissonance for me. I don't think that we should be pointing fingers if we're not doing anything better ourselves. So my solution was to become more open and transparent myself. At this point, um, sadly, I was already involved. I had the data conducted, so I couldn't do a pre-registration anymore, which doesn't mean that you can't open up your project even after the fact, after having done everything. Um, so my solution was to be, um, post everything on open science framework, so the OSF, and also put out a preprint um, because I knew that 
being able to publish this paper is going to take a bit of time, which it does actually. But again, I was running into even more problems. You can't believe it. First of all, where the heck was my R code? Setting up the OSF page was no big deal whatsoever. Finding all the files that I used during my project was a struggle. Um, my R code wasn't on my normal drive, it wasn't on my laptop, it wasn't on my student account, it wasn't on my working account at that time. It was just gone. It literally vanished. Big, big no if you're trying to be open and transparent, right? Um, luckily, my supervisor had the code and was able to send it to me, so that's open in OSF now. Analyses in Excel are not reproducible. I didn't know that at the time. I wasn't planning on making this open. So my solution was to sit down for a week and do all the steps over that I've done in Excel, now in R. And again, that's open on OSF now. The tone. Um, part of my research project involved a qualitative evaluation. And sometimes you could read me going off of it. So um, what the heck is going on here? Why would you even say that? Things like that. Things that you don't really want to put into the open. So I went back and kind of polished the tone of my qualitative reevaluations before putting it on OSF again. And lastly, and one of the most important things for me, nerves. It is very, very well, anxiety inducing, I think that's the right word, if you are trying to be open and if you're trying to be transparent, because it does make you vulnerable and it does make, give others the option, and as Samin pointed out earlier, um, to also scrutinize to work and to really dig into the details and rip it apart. Um, I remember my heart pounding when I clicked public on OSF, and I still have that when I look back into my projects and see that they are public, I still get this tiny bit of like, this is there for everybody to see. Um, so these are the struggles, right? And I just want to make it human. It's a human experience. That's something that can happen. But there are, like the others um, already mentioned, many, many, many benefits of being open. And I'm going to share the ones that I personally experienced. Um, for example, this is my published uh, OSF page. It contains all the materials. And I do I have to say that I'm kind of proud for all of this to be there um, for other people to look at. And I haven't received an email yet saying you made a mistake. So that's a good thing. Right? I published a preprint. Um, it doesn't matter how many people read it, but at least a few people read it. And I did get comments on that. And that's nice because that paper has been rejected, I think, two or three times now. Three times. Uh, and it's still in review at another journal. So it's going to take a while until this is published. People can be at the pulse of time and know that I've done this and this is out there. Um, I was able to give a conference talk about this project, um, which was a very exciting experience. And I also have collaborations now because people know what I'm doing and know my work and can read my work. And we have a follow up project planned, which is super exciting and at the stage of being set up at the moment. So, my takeaway for you is. To practice science openly is as much a reward as it is work. And don't believe anybody who says it's not work because it is, um, but it's going to pay off in the long term. And secondly, every single step counts. Um, as you can see, um, this presentation, for example, isn't perfect. There's uh, little nits and bits that I don't like about it. But this is my first presentation that I made in our markdown just for you guys. I tried that out. Um, so I'm now able to, if you're interested, send you the code and you can just click it and reproduce my presentation perfectly. And I think that's nice. And most importantly, and Samin and Enoch has stressed that already, it's nothing that you have to do on your own. This is something that we do together. Um, and there is the reproducibility of Herningen, which I'm also co-hosting, which is always there for you. Um, if you have questions, if you just need a session to rant about something, if you want to learn stuff, so there's loads to learn, and I don't know half of it. Um, there's the Open Science Community Groningen. They're also always very, very happy to help you, very approachable, organizing lovely events together with the university library, such as this one. And also, I linked the workshops of the university library down here. I attended them myself, and I find them immensely helpful. So while you're doing this, don't forget to celebrate every little step that you take, because every minor, tiny improvement um, it's worth it and you should be proud of yourself. Thanks. Mary, thank you very much for your inspiring talk.
very nice to hear about your struggles, but also the, the benefits that you, you experience. Um, Time-wise, we have to continue. Oh, that's interesting. Um, we have to continue with the, the next speaker. A question, if we have time, we can, uh, people can ask questions at the end of this session. Uh, we now continue with Joram Kunkels. Um, he presents the, IS, the ESM item course repository on behalf of his team. Uh, Joram, the floor is yours. Yes, hello. Uh, can you hear me all? Oh, I can you Great. Yeah, I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about the uh, ESM item repository. Uh, I will try to share my screen or my tablet with you. And uh, hopefully you will also see our web page. This is uh, the home page of the ESM item repository. Um, in general, it is quite simply an online repository for ESM items. For those uh, less initiated, ESM items are questions from the daily diary method. And this is a method wherein participants are offered uh, questions or items um, on a daily basis at intervals. These questions can assess mood or uh, things like that. Example would be, um, yeah, I feel happy today. So why did we even start? Um, yeah, this repository. We started in 2018 uh, during a hackathon with the Belgian Dutch ESM network. And there was a problem uh, that we saw and want to solve. Um, because ESM research is quite new, uh, many people are still developing um, yeah, items for this. There is not a distinct set of items which are already available and which can be used easily. So um, people are often led to design their own items and there is a lot of variation because of the indie items. But next to that, there wasn't that much of an overview in what items are available. So we figured that researchers uh, all around the world were reinventing the wheel every time, uh, dedicating resources and time to develop these items um, while perhaps there uh, are already items out there which can be used easily so um, yeah we started out with a plan to make an online uh, repository for this and of course the first step was just to um, yeah get people to submit items and I was quite uh, surprised by how motivated motivated most researchers uh, were to help us to collect all these items and put them in this online repository uh, it often took them quite some time to um, yeah, look where all these items were coming from to find out the details about it. Um, but we were very, very lucky that these people were willing to um, yeah, do this work and uh, support us with it. So in quite a short time, uh, we already collected quite a lot of items, uh, a few hundred even. Um, and it was quite enough to start uh, disseminating it via our website, esmitemrepository.com. Uh, this site was launched on the 8th of October 2019, so it's just uh, about one year in. And already we had like 5,000 uh, or more visitors. Uh, hopefully that will even grow more in the coming year. And we were able to um, collect uh, more than 750 ESM items. So as you uh, can now see the item repository, I can give you a quick tour of how it works. Uh, you have a uh, number of search topics where you can search on. There's, for example, English. Uh, let's uh, think of a search term. Um, I want to uh, have items uh, dedicated to happiness. So I feel in happy here. And search the database. And we already found nine items which um, yeah, had the word happy in there. So very quickly, you can get a nice overview of items that are used by researchers worldwide on specific topics. Um, you can also search on, uh, for example, population, uh, some citations if you want to um, yeah, look at different research groups, what kind of items they use. 
So I think, um, yeah, this, this enables people to um, yeah, be informed of what is available very easily. And um, we also have a dedicated download section uh, where you can easily download your item selection. So if you only wanted um, items about happiness, you can uh, download them and the details we collected. So you can do your own analyses in this and um, yeah, provide you with even more overview. So um, it's uh, always growing. Uh, so if you are working with ESM items and think, uh, I would love to add these to the repository, um, you can easily uh, collaborate with us. There is a, a nice welcome package and an overview of how to um, do this on uh, OSI. There is a, a link to this on our post site. And um, yeah, we're quite happy that in such a short time we already, uh, yeah, we're able to build so much. Um, yeah, of course, I didn't do this on my own. Uh, we did it with a team, uh, which is needed in such a large project, um, mostly from the KU Leuven, uh, as were Olivia, Anu, Martina, Davinia, and Ines. And I'm uh, very happy that we were able to work together to get this uh, very nice project, I guess, uh, from the ground. And uh, hopefully with this presentation, when uh, we can also inspire you, if you use ESM items, just to have a quick look at the item repository, uh, see if you can find anything that's informative for you. So, um, yeah, that was my talk about ESM item repository. Uh, I will give the word back uh, now. Yes. Thank you very much, Joram. It was very nice to hear your story and, and to see how you build up a, an open resource um, um, environment for ESM items. Um, we are going to continue with our next speaker first. Questions we leave again for at the end of the sessions. Um, so now I want to give the floor to Marike Helmich um, from the um, uh, psychiatry department um, and she will present her work to you now. Yeah, thanks for handing over the mic to me. Um, my name is Marika. I'm a PhD student studying depression uh, and recovery in depression. And I would just like to briefly share with you the story of how I pre-registered um, my analysis choice for a set of preconceived hypotheses that I myself did not um, make up. And um, how the feeling of doing this pre-registration left me with feeling at least a little bit towards my professor who had written up the hypotheses. Could you please be more specific? Um, and let's see if I can click through. I want to start with a little disclaimer, which is that I will actually not go into specifics about my research. Um, but instead, I will just tell you uh, still the story, which I hope you will find uh, interesting about open science in my part. So how it started. I started my uh, PhD as part of a larger project that was set up by my professor. So I applied, there was already a project for me in place. And uh, this project is called Transit. And uh, it was basically sort of like, hi, let's collect some data. And uh, this was nice, of course, because you have a, you know, you don't have to come up with all the methods and everything yourself. And it was an ambitious project. And so uh, this is a, a nice place to start. Um, but the data collection took some time. And then it took some more time. And then it took quite a bit of time. And so about 2,000 years later or so, it felt, um, we had collected data and it was finally time for me to get this core paper that was at the heart of my project started. Um, and I realized at that point, hey, but wait, what, huh? what am I actually dealing with here? Am I doing confirmatory work or is it a little bit exploratory? Now, I think this has already been touched upon uh, in the previous presentations, but just to repeat to everyone, uh, if you're doing confirmatory studies, your work will un like be based on the existing set of hypotheses, which will guide your methodological choices. You will hopefully, possibly be replicating what has been done before, and your aim is to test whether your specific idea is indeed supported by the data that you've uh, collected or that you're going to collect. Um, 
that as opposed to exploratory work where you want to just like learn new things about the kind of data that you've collected. What is there? Can I generate new hypotheses? And maybe you don't have any prior assumptions necessarily, um, but you uh, want to explore anyway what is there. That's both really worthwhile. But my challenge was that my project came with a set of hypotheses that were based on a previous NS1 study. And that's nice, you know, this means, okay, great, I can just sort of use what has been done before and then apply it to my study, right? Well, no, okay, I cannot quite do confirmatory research because I'm studying a different population. Um, so, okay, maybe this phenomenon that I'm researching will work a little bit differently here. So I have to keep that in mind. I have to think about that. Um, and actually, this is sort of a study that is set up to repeat this N is one study in a larger N. That also means that probably analytically, you're going to have to make some different choices. So it's not quite confirmatory. Um, but how about the exploratory side then? Well, there is sort of a theoretical and empirical basis to some specific ideas that I can start uh, examining. But yeah, it's that means it's quite exploratory because I do want to know the answer to these questions. <laughs> Where am I now? Well, I felt like I was kind of in a hypothesis limbo, sort of in between exploratory, not quite confirmatory, in this sort of gray area. Um, and this made me feel like I cannot simply start doing my research like this and uh, pre-register these broad hypotheses and think that this is sufficient, you know? Uh, and I cannot just publish my data like this because it's such a like new subject on one hand that I could be accused sort of if I don't um, sort of do my work really transparently I could be accused possibly of sort of uh, harking so hypothesizing after the results are known um, so I really want to be transparent so what did I do or what would I also recommend others to do if you are in this kind of hypothesis limbo really 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 think your analysis through and have a contingency plan. So uh, this kind of multiverse analysis that has already been mentioned uh, is, of course, a way to also do this, to explore and think if you really have some ideas, have some questions, but you're not sure what is the best way to go about it. Um, but have a contingency plan so that you know what to do in less ideal conditions. Maybe your data is not normal. Maybe you cannot answer it with the test you wanted. So you also want to include robustness checks. Maybe there are different tests that you could use to find the same thing, but you aren't sure which one would be actually suitable for your data. Um, and you have to prepare to share results and supplements, or at least that's what I want to do. Uh, because if I'm going to test hypotheses, but at the same time work on it a little bit in terms of exploration as well, I want to show what I've done. I don't want to just present the things that are prettiest and nicest. Uh, plus, I want to actually have other people benefit from my explorations. So what I've also done is um, made my materials open in advance. This was also a way for me to sort of collect my thoughts. So uh, I opened on OSF my detailed study protocol. I put there the relevant questionnaires, which are actually in sampling questionnaires. Um, I placed there my newly developed analysis method so that in advance already this was made available and then by the time I was going to do my actual study it would be clear that this was done way before and of course finally free register and sort of show um, what uh, what I then re pre registered since it's a little bit in the middle of exploratory and confirmatory I just decided to be clear about that in the pre-registration. So here's a little quote from what I had written in the pre-registration. We note here that the analysis plan described below is intended as a starting point to test our hypotheses, followed by further exploration. This is a registration of what we believe a priori to be the best approach to answering a research question. Because we really, really, really did spend a lot of time thinking about it. and. Uh, we do have some good ideas about how to go about it. It might not work out, and that's fine, but this way at least we can show that we did think about it uh, in advance, these things. So that's, uh, that's my talk, and uh, thank you very much for letting me speak today. Are there any questions? Thank you very much, uh, Marike, for your interesting talk. Uh, there is time for questions now. So, th is anyone in the audience who has a question? 
please um, raise your hand or type them in the uh, in the chat. See, I see no questions in the chat. Um, I have a question for uh, Marika. Uh, you had a lot of. Um, you have, you have been very careful in describing all the, the the steps you were taking and also mentioning the uncertainty. Um, how was it to write up your research afterwards, dealing with all the contingencies that you described before? Well, I'm still in the process of writing it up, but um, basically it feels like I've already done the analysis for, like I've written up the entire analysis section for my paper. I've already written up in this process the whole methods for uh, my manuscript. And um, actually doing the analyses by thinking it through so thoroughly, um, it was actually in that sense pretty easy to uh, just copy the structure that I had um, written down for this pre-registration and just use it for, well, my R markdown, my script. Um, and that's, in that sense, really did clarify sort of the choices that I'd made and why I'd made them uh, and also what I wanted to show. So it was, it felt all the time really scary and uncertain in a way because there was so much to do and so much to show, um, but at the same time really gratifying to be able to then work on doing it later on. Right, thank you. Um, I also have a question for Joram. Um, Simin mentioned in her talk that um, openness doesn't necessarily uh, directly make something good or um, um, something good side or, or valid. Um, and um, in your platform, the ESM repository, people can uh, post their measures. Um, yep. But it's, yeah. I think, not yet known what the validity of those measures is. Uh, are you going to take that into account? Yeah, that's indeed a, a very good question. Um, we're now in the first phase of the ESM item repository. So that means it's really a warts and all version. Um, we are planning to uh, check the quality of these items which we are uh, collecting in the, the second phase. Um, but yeah, that's a very important Point. And um, I think collecting all these items in a dedicated repository also allows us to um, yeah, efficiently research the validity of all these items. So yes, that's definitely on our agenda. Uh, nice to hear that that is the, the second step in your, uh, uh, in your program. Very nice. Um, I also have a question for all three of you. So the, as discussed, the, Open Research Awards had a two-stage two uh, process, namely first um, checked every submission whether they adhere to the eligibility criteria, um, but then the eventual winner was determined um, by a lottery and next up in the program is a uh, discussion about the use of, of lotteries for the um, awarding of grants or research funding. We're going to talk about pros and cons, but we have three People who experienced getting an award uh, based on uh, the lottery, partly. Um, how is it, was it for you to uh, receive an award partly based on luck? Did it feel different, or to elaborate a bit on that experience? Um, Merle, can you start? Yeah, sure. Um, so first, a disclaimer: one of the reasons why I chose this award as the first submission for me personally was that it was based on a lottery system. So it wouldn't hurt that much if I wasn't picked for it. Um, that was one of the things that I was thinking about before. Being one of the lucky ones, of course, is really cool. And I so much appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today. Um, it did hamper the enjoyment a little bit for me personally, um, being one of the lucky ones and having luck only. That's not to say that I'm not a fan of the lottery idea for grant um, submissions because I do think that there is a certain stage where you just can't distinguish um, the quality of proposals anymore and where it makes loads of sense to not 
then base that on subjective. Um, I don't like this, or I don't like that person, or this little tiny detail is, is not really thought through. I'd rather go into a lottery and then have people decide on luck. Um, I would be super interested, though, to hear from someone who did not get the award um, how they felt not being the lucky ones. Oh, that is a good suggestion. Uh, first, thank you for your giving your uh, um, point of view. Um, yeah, we should have asked us to join as well. Maybe they are here and they can, they can mention uh, uh, if they are in the audience. Uh, if they want to say something, uh, uh, please speak up. Um, in the meanwhile, we can go to uh, Joram, I guess, to, to hear your view. Yeah, I uh, agree with Merle indeed. Um, I, I think the lottery is a very interesting way um, to, to do these things. Um, yeah, at first, I also experienced a little bit of uh, when we won it. Uh, that was more due to luck than due to uh, quality or something. But of course, this is a um, yeah, weird thing to think, right? We had this uh, process uh, before uh, just to uh, check the eligibility. So the quality of all the submissions were uh, good. And uh, what I really like is that you really try to apply these uh, um, yeah, quite new ideas in practice, right? Everyone is talking about, yeah, this very few thing is not uh, ideal, these rankings. But nobody, um, yeah, gives it the time and effort in practice. So I think this is a very um, good way to do it. You yeah, thank you very much for your point of view, um, Marika. Yeah, um, I was thinking because I think in in this case there were fourteen eligible applications, which is a nice number, I think, for a lottery. But I was wondering, like, what about if this is for like a much bigger award and there's like much more applicants, uh, many more applicants, then then it becomes a little bit strange because there's probably more uh, dispersion in how good the applications are. Uh, maybe there was still quite a bit of dispersion here, but I suppose uh, for 14 applications, it seems fair enough. But I wonder if there's like 200, uh, if a lottery would still feel fair. Um, in it, like my own experience was, oh, so nice, but also like, ah, but I had good odds, you know, like, so that's, that's okay. So I wondered, um, like, if this were to be done for other kinds of like awards or grants or this kind of thing, if there should still be at least, of course, an eligibility check, but also still some kind of quality assessment before. Um, I enjoy the idea that um, this is random. And sometimes you feel like, oh, but why didn't I get chosen or why did I get chosen? Like what happened here? Like with, uh, I've had this before with poster presentations or something like this. I know a colleague who's definitely had this with a poster presentation before. Um, and um, there it's, it's just, it feels arbitrary anyway for the selection committee. And um, yeah, with this, at least you know how, what, what the basis was. So that's, I still enjoyed it, but that's also because I won. So I, I definitely agree with Merla, what happened with the people who didn't win, you know? Yeah, I can imagine the, the, um, those feelings. Um, are there any people in the session that didn't win the awards based on the lottery uh, that want to comment? I think that is not the case. Oh, sure. Uh, Robin, go ahead. Can you hear me now or not? Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I thought it was very fair. Of course, it's like a bit of a pity uh, that I didn't win. But otherwise, like, how are you going to judge something like this? And that's the same sometimes with posters. Like, how are you really going to compare so many different posters, which are all great in their own right, or at least uh, most of them are? So I think I really liked it, and I would wish almost that more things would be uh, randomly um, uh, yeah, sort of awarded. Thank you very much, Robin, that you wanted to, uh, to provide your perspective. Um, yeah, we are going to wrap this part of the session up now. Uh, after the break, which will last until quarter to four, um, after the break, we will start the panel discussion. Um, 
about the luck of the draw and then panel uh, members will discuss the, the, the pros and cons about um, uh, introducing a lottery system. So I'm really looking forward uh, to that session. Um, I'll see you in uh, a bit less than 15 minutes. And once again, thank you for giving this very interesting and inspiring uh, talks to us. Thanks for having us.